six. None. Okay, I will call the question on uh, the exception or the approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor? And opposed? Seeing none, uh, that carries unanimously. I'm looking for an adoption of the agenda for this evening's meeting as circulated. Moved by Trustee Kershaw, seconded by Trustee Karpuk. Any additions or deletions to this evening's agenda? Yes, Trustee Karpuk. 213, please. 213, thank you. Any other additions or deletions? Seeing none, um, we looked, uh, sorry, uh, all those in favor of the adoption of the agenda with the additions made, all those in favor? Thank you, and those opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, that moves us on to this evening's education topic, uh, which I will turn it over to you, um, Dr. Anderson, uh, for outdoor education in action. Through you, Board Chair Grieve, to the board. Outdoor education provides learning experiences for students to engage in activities that develop a sense of independence, creativity, and to promote real world problem solving and a respect for our environment. Outdoor education can take place anywhere. And in School District 73, we are very fortunate to have a site dedicated to outdoor learning in the McQueen Lake Environmental Education Center. Principal Law, who leads learning at Bird Edwards Science and Technology School, as well as McQueen Lake, will be sharing about the benefits of outdoor education and how students engage in learning activities with a focus on the McQueen Lake Environmental Education Center. I now invite Assistant Superintendent of Early Learning and Elementary Education, Grant Riley, to introduce Principal Law. Thank you, Superintendent Nixon, Board Chair Agree, Vice Chair Wade, Trustees. Superintendent Nixon introduced your staff. I'd like to introduce Mr. Fred Law, Principal of Bird Edwards Science and Technology School and the Queen Lake Environmental Education Center. Principal Law is here this evening to present on the power of outdoor education and students learning by focusing on the experiences available in Queen Lake. As well, Principal Law will detail the ongoing improvements that continue to shape the learning at McQueen Lake and the possibilities for the future of outdoor education. And I would like to add, even though it's not in my introduction, <laughs> we are very fortunate to hear Mr. Frank Law in his last year as a principal as he's retiring. So with that, please welcome Principal Law. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Riley. I'm super happy to be here again. The second in our series of outdoor education topics. I was here again while I was here last year and talk a little bit about outdoor education and super happy to be here again this year. This is gonna work for me. I'm starting off with a picture that's really near and dear to me. This is right in behind my parents' house and it's about a kilometer away from my elementary school where I spent seven years, Public Park Elementary in Comox, British Columbia, Canada. And we had a teacher at, at uh, College Park named Mr. McFedrin. Mr. McFedrin taught grade four. And one of the things that Mr. McFedrin did every year is he took his students down to the river and he studied life down the river, in particular the spawning salmon down the river. And I remember so desperately wanting to be in Mr. McFedrin's class. And luckily I was put in his class and I remember going down there and I was at this very spot and I took this picture at spring break just to show my kids back at school. And they were really uh, uh, powerful, exciting experiences for me. And I remember them to this day and it was over 50 years ago and I believe um, that outdoor education can have a really powerful impact on our students. The research backs up my experience. The research tells us that outdoor education improves student attention behavior, standardized test scores, attitude and attendance, it employs a greater range of children's intelligence, inches, Intelligences, sense of self-independence, confidence, creativity, decision-making, problem-solving skills, empathy towards others, motor skills, self-discipline and initiative, and it connects families and communities to the school. This is a picture of our day center up at McQueen Lake, and you're gonna see pictures of the day center frequently throughout this presentation. Right down the hill, if you're right at the bottom of that little hill, is a pond. 
Last year, I talked about outdoor education in and around the school grounds, and three of these four pictures are children outside at our school, Great Edward Science and Technology School. The first one up on top, top left, Roxanne Letterlow is teaching the salmon dance. The one on the top right is our grade three drumming group. The one at the bottom right is Joanne Nicholas with her CETA Street Pro Stream program with our grade two students. So tons of opportunity in and around school grounds for outdoor <coughs> education. And the one on the bottom left is down at the river uh, on our annual river stay. So think of when you're going in and around this school, McGowan Park with the wetlands, Dufferin Elementary with Kenneth Carway Park, all sorts of natural opportunities around our schools for outdoor education. Our grade two class is going to release their salmon next week. They're going out to Tronkeel Creek. So lots of opportunity out in the community as well. Today, we're going to focus, though, on McQueen Lake. So last time I was here, last year around this time, I only talked about McQueen Lake for a couple of minutes. This year, I'm going to talk about McQueen Lake for the rest of the presentation. I'm going to start right with the planning phase, what teachers actually do, what principals actually do, leading up to an actual trip to McQueen Lake, and then go over some of the initiatives that we've been undertaking the last 12 to 24 months out of McQueen Lake and looking forward to the future of McQueen Lake. So right around this time of year, as a matter of fact, it happened on Friday, I send out this letter to all the principals in our school districts, indicating how many buses they have got allotted to their school, um, supplied by the districts to go to McQueen Lake. We've got six different categories on this sheet now. We've only got five, but we added the six this year for schools over 400. The allotments for busing are based on the number of students that they're projecting to be in the school, so students school enrollment as of right now. We've also taken into consideration the catchment area changes. So the three schools that have been into, that have been put into category six are, I believe, Aberdeen, Lloyd George, and Juniper. Aberdeen being right now projected as a school that's gonna have the greatest enrollment at around 476. So six different categories of school, they all get buses according to their projected student enrollment. Also attached to this email that I sent out to principals was a link to the Queen Lake website where the principals can go in, they can log into the website, they can see how many buses they've been allotted, they can see how many buses that have been used, they can see which teachers have booked buses and when it, the individual classes are going up to the Queen Lake. Then around the same time, Mr. Deptuck and I send out this letter to all teachers and all administrators. And this is the booking page from McQueen Lake. So teachers, can go on to this, go on to this um, form, fill in this form. It's a booking request from McQueen Lake. This goes live on next Sunday, the 8th. And the spots from McQueen Lake are actually hotly contested. So it's, it's open at 8 o'clock at night, and teachers start booking right away, 8 o'clock at night, because they want to get those spots at the beginning of the year where they're team building with their students and their classes in September and October, where the weather's really nice. Or they'd like to get into the end of the year in May and June where the weather's really nice again, they're wrapping up their year. So those four months in particular are really popular for McQueen Lake, as opposed to the brave souls that are going in February when it's minus 30. Oh, there's plenty to do up there at that time, but it's really popular. Teachers really want to go there beginning of the year, end of the year. So they, they the teachers request a day, month, they put in the various information, their in name, their cell number, talk a little bit about bond kits. All this information goes to Mr. Deptuck who's our McQueen Lake resource teacher, and he's an absolute treasure to have at the McQueen Lake. Any of you that know him, he's been up there for over 20 years. He and Dan Sarge and the caretaker up there, um, if they blood, I'm sure you'd like to hear this before, they bleed McQueen colors because they do everything up there um, in the interest of McQueen Lake and the students. So teachers fill out this form. Information then goes to Mr. Daptop. Mr. Daptop uh, goes through and sees if there's any conflicts, he makes a master schedule like this. Master schedule is shared with myself and uh, Mr. Sergeant. We have that on our phones. So I've got something every day and there's usually five or six or seven things every day. Get a master schedule with teachers informed of what things they have or they might need to change if there's double booking. And Mr. Daptuck uh, then initiates the booking of the bus. So we booked the bus for the classes. What the classes have to do in the teachers is along with their principal, fill out the permission form, of course, to go to McQueen Lake. So um, bookings are entered, busing is arranged for the teachers they have that time. Then before the, before the trip, Mr. Deptuck goes for a pre-trip orientation session in the classroom. So he'll go to the classroom, that's Mr. Mr. Deptuck up front in the orange shirt. He talks to the children and sometimes there's parents present, teachers for sure, an orientation site. These are the cabins, this is the cookhouse. 
these are the trails, that sort of thing. But for safety considerations, need a chaperone if you're going to be going alone to your um, cabin. Um, if you're on the trails, you need to stay on the trails, that sort of thing. Those are the trip specific. So you might be taking, for instance, a, a set of orienteering um, kits out know, to the school with some compasses and things and goes over those. You might be taking some snowshoes and showing the children how to use those. So Mr. Deptep goes out and liaises with the class, the teacher, before the trip. Now, I'm going to play about five minutes of this clip. If anyone would like to see the rest of this in consideration of time, please just let me know. So this is an actual trip up to McLean Lake. We took some video of. Um, it's pretty It's pretty awesome. I think there's a little boy in there that I know really well that you're going to see right off the bat that was up uh, at some time with uh, Dufferin Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And there's we're trying to create a contrast between the tranquility of McLean Lake and the 50 10 year olds that are going up to the <laughs> quiet. I think it's a little easier. So I'm going to play for about five minutes. Um, oh, I know what I have to do. Silly. I can't do full screen if I'm on slideshow. What you got? A green frog. Toad. Ah! Yeah. Oh. It scares him when it jumps. Do you like them? Oh, yes. Fifty degrees. Forty-nine point eight five two. Yeah. 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 Whatever happened to yeah. not running? <laughs> Nothing. It's just gone. Yeah, it does. It's supposed to. Can somebody hold these? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it goes. We've done them all. We're just trying to get back now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There it is. I just put this rallying ball. Good. It looks like a smile. There it is. Really. Why not you here? What's that? What's that? No. Stop. Stop. Get out, Mr. D. Oh yeah, they grow fast, those aspens. There's another one. Where are we heading on to? There's one right, right there. Right there. Oh. But this is a leaf miner, and that's kind of a general term for any uh, insect that has a larva stage that kind of goes through a leaf like that and goes between the layers, top and bottom layer of the leaf. And you can see them there. Do you see the light little wormy larva? You can see where the egg was laid, and then it, it got bigger as it went back and forth. And that brown line is actually just a poop line. Yeah, eating poop the whole way. <laughs> and then when it gets over to this side of the leaf, it will curl it over and go into the pupa. And it'll pupate and fly away. I found another one. And start it all over again. And it's a true bug. It has piercing mouth parts, unlike a beetle. Right? Beetles have chompers. And uh, bugs have a wings that cross on the back and a piercing mouth part. And they don't go through larva, pupa, adult. They just go smaller bug to bigger bug. What is that? Whoa!
Okay, and how about Cole and Calvin? Wait, Did no, you guys two see? Okay, yeah. how, how big, guys? One, two, two centimeters. Two centimeters? One, two, three. No, it's not. Oh. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's not. Um, violet. Yeah, that's a violet. Wow. Nobody's done here. We found a violet. That's right, man. Thank you. Hey, I bought it. <laughs> All right. So the first thing you're gonna see on your fishing line. I do. With okay. two, it's just. Okay. Twisting. What did we have? We had three. No, four. Four. Right here. Five. Okay, so now you're going to pull it in the opposite direction. So you hold this and over the six One. Now you hook this. Yeah, that's Yay! did not do the bail Oh my god. I did it! And now you put it up. See? Every time you lift it up. Which means, which means that they cool. breathe through their skin almost. Where is he? Where? Oh, oh, that's that's right there. Right there. Yeah, <laughs> found it. Is he like? <gasps> I see a, something big. Right the big one. Where's the big one? Right there. Right there. Whoa! It's moving. So you do not touch them because they're skin Why porous. Why can't it be big no, no, one, Miss Hat? No, no, no. I'm looking at the big one. And there's a little one. Oh, the salmon. Oh, the two. Right no, there. No, no, no. Oh, I see this. I see I see there's a big salamander. Oh, look at a big guy. Daddy, can't you believe me? I'm taking one of the salamander. Two of them. There's two. Where's the full? There's the big one. By Mr. Depp Tuck's hand. There's, there's, there's a little one, right one and a big bottom. one. You want to take a picture? Okay. Don't touch it. What? <laughs> this is big awesome. one. So that's a pretty typical trip. They don't show you what happens at night, which of course gets a little different, but um, <laughs> children, you can just hear the excitement in their voices, right? The exuberance and the, um, the passion for learning outdoors. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my slide. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about what's been going on up there. Silly. So this is our classroom. You can see the outside of the classroom, and then on the right, the inside of the classroom. As many of you might remember, we had propane lighting in the classroom up until last year, and we did a safety inspection of the whole site last year. Um, Melissa Spaghetti came up, Jim McFadden came up. It was pretty intensive, and what we did um, with the classroom is we took out all of the, the propane lights that were in there. So Dan used to go, Mr. Sergeant used to go and light them up. Um, turn the gas on, light them up, and he had, was getting a little exuberant with his fire one time, and he got the, one of the beams caught fire, and now it didn't spread anywhere, it just, it just caught fire a little bit, plus we found that the carbon monoxide levels were unacceptable in the building, so put in LED lighting throughout the classroom, it looks absolutely fantastic, Chris Horton, who's a district electrician, did it all, and did a really, really good job. We put, and it's hard to believe we didn't have these already, we put fire um, detectors and carbon monoxide detectors throughout all the cabins. We put new heaters in the teacher and this is Kenna Cartwright cabin over here to the right. Kenna Cartwright cabin on the right, we put new heaters in the Kenna Cartwright cabin and we're working with, liaising with TRU Trades Department to do some renovations with teacher cabin. So that's a work in progress and we'll work looking for it in the next few years. They didn't have as many students attending their trades program as they have in the past, but they've committed to actually coming out there and helping us out with that. We made some modifications to the challenge area. This is a favorite spot of McQueen Lake. It's a favorite spot for students who really like to use it. It's a favorite spot for teachers in between activities. We go there and have fun at the challenge area. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen playgrounds from years and years gone by, but some of the slides, for example, like children had to climb up 10 feet to slide down the slide. And, it was dangerous. And we found the same thing at um, the challenge area. Mr. Sergeant cut down. So we did another safety inspection with Melissa of the challenge area. We made some modifications to make it more inclusive. And, and so that um, involved cutting everything down, making things a little closer to the ground, removing obstacles like rocks and trees from alongside the challenge area. We 
took down the wall at the end of the challenge area. There's a big climbing wall that was 10 feet high with a rope. The favorite spot people go up at the end of the challenge area. So we took that, we haven't taken it down yet, we just haven't had anyone use that. This poor person looks like they're about ready to fall down. Looks like they already have with all this on the back of them. That's me, by the way. I didn't see the picture I had of the climbing wall. That was like 20 years ago. I really enjoyed going up the climbing wall, but it's no longer there. We put in a new power system. So thanks so much to um to everyone here that supported the, the buying of the new battery system. This one was just installed. The McQueen Lake runs on a battery system and we have some generators out there, but if the battery system fails, the generators are gonna last about a day and then we're gonna be out of power. We've got some solar options up there. They just don't supply enough power to power the site. So these were purchased, I believe in 2016, it was a little bit before my time, the existing system. And it was around approximately $20,000 at the time and it was warranty for five years. So it just lasted five years. We're putting in a new one that's double the cost. It's lithium batteries, it's got double the warranty. So it's warranty for at least 10 years. My understanding of lithium as well is that if we have um, additional power needs up there that the lithium will be able to add to us where the, um, the other system we could not add to the power, to the power and, and get additional power up there. Really important, I think, for the school district to think of what are we going to be ideally using up there as a source of power, something that is potentially a little more friendly to the environment and um, a little more cost effective if we need solar panels, right? And, and I'm not sure if solar panels would be able to supply all the power that we need up there, but it's something long term to think about. We've done an inspection of all the buildings. We had an engineer come up and inspect all the buildings in the Queen Lake. We're still waiting on the inspection to come through. This is the day center. This is where our primary students typically spend their days. They eat their lunches in here. There's um, there's some benches, some, some uh, tables in here. They go down to the pond. They do their pond studies in here. So the day center, we're still waiting. And then we're going to put some new shingles up there. This spot right up here, if you can see my cursor on the hill, you're going to see in a few different pictures up top there. I'm going to show you in the next slide. In our kitchen area, our cooking area, we are working on getting an updated permit for the kitchen area. The one that was there was from 1995, which is the year my son was born. So that was like 27 years old. Things have changed since then. We're, we've got a few challenges ahead of us uh, with the septic for one with the transporting of food for another, those sorts of things in order to um, get that permit. We're hoping we're gonna be able to do that in the next little while, certainly for the summertime. I'm not sure if that's gonna happen this year, but um, we're certainly working on it. We're also assessing the ventilation system in the cookhouse. And I know Jim was up there a couple of weeks ago. I'm not exactly sure where we are with that, but it's something that we're cognizant of and working to um, fix up. Now there's that hill I was showing you before. Assistant Superintendent Mochikas and I were up looking at a site for the Shkwetmik Indigenous Cultural Center at Queen Lake. It's something that we've committed to several years ago, uh, building a Cooley house, a winter house in particular, somewhere at Queen Lake. We've had um, Leslie Libores of the Tukumlis Shkwetmik Culture and Heritage Department leading an assessment. She was up there a couple of weeks ago looking at the site and determining if it was going to be an appropriate site. It was absolutely beautiful. I think I'm correct in saying, Bestie, when we were up there, we and, and Principal Bowden and I were up there. It's a beautiful site. So we're hoping that we can break ground and get that going sometime in the next year or so. The Rotary Club of Kamloops, I believe it's the Daybreak Rotary Club, has already earmarked $30,000 for that site for us. And it's been, it's been three years. I think it's been three years we've been kicking it around and trying to get it going. So hopefully we are. We, we found the site. We, we feel this is a beautiful site. And if you're up there on that hill, it really is spectacular. Mm -hmm. We were up there last year at McQueen on a weekend. We had the Rotary Club up who is keenly, they seem keenly interested in helping us out. We built this bridge. There were six or seven people up there built this bridge over some water that was obstructing a path for students last year with the Rotary Club. Over on the right, you see our thought, or I'm not sure how many of you have heard about that, but in the absence of fundraising with our annual McQueen Lake dinner, we decided to do a thaw drop. So Dan and Wayne and I thought this up. And our idea, our idea was to get a mannequin, dress it up, put it out in the lake in the middle of winter, 
and challenge people to determine when it might fall through. So we had some help from the IT department in the school district who hooked up a wire to the mannequin. And there he is, called Manny from Mannequin. So there it's called the daughter up. And our idea was to sell tickets. We thought last year, last year was the first year we did it. We thought what we'd do is we'd, um, we'd experiment and just open it up to children in the school district. And it turned out to be hugely popular with classes. We gave classes, for instance, the historic temperatures up in the Queen Lake so they could estimate when many might fall through the ice. Um, this year, we tried to get a permit, unbeknownst to me. I wasn't aware that schools couldn't apply for permits. So next year, we're going to try to do it with the Rotary Club potentially applying for the permit and we can sell some tickets and hopefully make some money from the website. Anyway, this year, we had over 700 students from 45 classes to 22 different schools taking part. 33 students correct, uh, correctly identified the exact day that Manny fell through the ice. It was quite spectacular. We had a live feed on the Queen Lake site. The class actually went to the Queen Lake site and did not know at our school. And uh, we're quite excited about it all. We had two students that came within 30 seconds of when Manny fell through the ice. And those two students we mailed with our great thanks for participating in Queen Lake Limited Edition print. So it was it was quite successful. And hopefully in the future we can do something um, to make some money for the site as well. And Dan up there really, who's up there quite often by himself, the caretaker, really thinks this is fantastic. It really takes it to heart. So it's a real motivator for him. We have also been contacted by the Outland Youth Employment Program. Now, I'm just getting to know this group. They say they seem really super keen to be used the Queen Lake site, and I've talked to Assistant Superintendent Riley about this as well. We've had people, in my understanding, we've had groups, rental groups, up at the Queen Lake site over the summertime just for a weekend for a short period of time. They'd like to use the site for six weeks, and they run a program for Indigenous youth at risk. It's, it's a work program. It sounds, um, it sounds pretty awesome. Uh, I would like to see it go ahead. The camera to come with the Shkwetmik would really like to see it go ahead. Um, right now, again, the, the permit for the kitchen is something that is holding us back. It's still a little ways away for the 20s, and I believe it's mid-July till mid-August. They're so keen on using the site that the, their administrator actually said, we'll bring up our own kitchen a trailer to, to use up there in our own showers and whatnot but it, it would be um it would be a partnership that would see some revenue i would believe come into the to the McQueen lake site at the same time of blue support in particular our indigenous community so we're hopefully going to get that going ahead this year is our 50 year anniversary so it's been 50 years since the McQueen lake was established and we've established a committee of really keen people yeah, there it is, I hope. Yes, so we got a Google Doc. We, stopped, we, we made up a Google Doc. We've only had one meeting so far. Tentatively scheduled this 50th anniversary celebration for Saturday, October 1st, 2022, up at the McQueen Lake site. So we've made up uh, some committees. Our theme is going to be past, present, and future with goals to support our community. So we've got Mr. Depp talking to Mr. Wagner on activities, advertising, we've got community liaison, we've got food, we've got safety and food safety transportation committees. We have made up a list of people and it's just started that we believe should be invited to this, should be people that um, we contact first of all to make sure they're there that have been, uh, that have been involved with McQueen Lake for years. So 50th anniversary is coming up. And we're looking at transporting people up, ideally from somewhere in town, having some light refreshments, having some activities up on site, having some speakers that are going to speak to the history of the, of the site, that sort of thing. So it's a real, what I emphasize um, in closing here, it's, it's just a really unique site. I've been involved up there for two years as the principal, and it's, it's something special amongst all the buildings I think that we have here in our school district. I think it's something special in British Columbia, if not Canada and North America. And special because so many people in our community have visited up there. So many children have gone through the McQueen Lake site. Teachers really drive the McQueen Lake program. We support the teachers, the board, um, senior members here at the board office, myself, Wayne, Dan. Teachers drive what's happening up there. If you go to Eagle Bay or something for year-end field trips for our schools, they've got a staff up there to take care of everything. It's the teachers and Mr. Deputy and Mr. Sergeant to take everything at our site. Um, our 
our building department, our maintenance department takes care of everything up there within, I mean, most of everything, right? They're up there installing the battery system now. Um, the support from the board over the years, the current support has been absolutely fantastic and we appreciate it so much. And I'm getting the opportunity now here on behalf of everyone involved, like students, staff, um, children especially, to thank the board for, for their support and the Moon Lake site over the years. We so much appreciate it. And uh, a big congratulations is in order for, for everyone, I think, in our school district for, for what we've accomplished with this site. It's, it's truly unique and special. And that's all I've got for tonight. Really appreciate your time. And again, all your support with Queen Lake over the years. Any thoughts or questions or? I have many, but I'm going to turn to my phone. <laughs> Trustees first. Well, I have many thoughts. Um, <clears throat> Trustee Small. Um, the lithium batteries, um, yeah. that intrigues me. There, there obviously has to be a way of charging them because if you're just draining them all on their own, they potentially lose all the power, correct? Yeah, well, I, I think so. Now, there's a, there's a fellow that helps us out at... Right here in town, the energy system fellow, but he explained it in detail to me. And we have to decide between the different options and the expense, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure if they can be recharged indefinitely. So they've got a warranty for 10 years. So they'll go for 10 years without needing to be recharged at all? No, that's a good question. I'm well, not sure. I'm impressed. Yeah. Ronna knows the answer. I don't think they have to be recharged. I think they're attached to solar panels, are they? Okay. Excuse me? You have solar panels that charge them? They don't charge the batteries. I don't think they can fully charge the batteries. Hmm. Any other questions or comments? Yes, trust me. <clears throat> uh, for the category um, one uh, students, how many schools? schools? Yeah. Um, how many of them go? I looked the other day, and almost all of the schools in our district that were allotted buses had gone. There were two schools that hadn't attended at all, and I sent emails and corresponded with those those school administrators and just reminded them that they had a few trips left. And you know, that's that's one thing that I'm not sure if there's anything that we can do as a school district about this, but not everyone always gets the option. Everyone I mean students get an equal opportunity to come to McLean. Like the teachers that go up every year and they're right there and they're booking right away and you've got some that never go. My two kids went through the school system and my daughter went on an overnight trip my son never went up at all. So how do we make it more equitable for all? It's a very good question. Because it, it's the teachers, especially for the you overnight you challenge, you can imagine. You <laughs> I was just saying it, she was just saying she knew she knew where I was going with that one. So I appreciate you being just ahead, just ahead of the curve and just identifying that, you know, some schools, if they've got, you know, some of that staff turnover that they don't or know that they're going to retire, they don't get their naming cue. So, but it's an important asset and uh, certainly the, the distribution. So I really appreciate your, your lens on that. Thank you. And there's, there's almost always opportunities to go. Even now, I bet we could get in but likely on an overnight trip, but if the class even now contacted us to go up there, it's one of the various sites, whether it's Isabel or McQueen, that they can get up there. Any other questions or comments from trustees? <laughs> No, so just before you go, I um I want I will I will say obviously thank you so much for the presentation. I just wanted to to say I appreciate what you were saying in terms of that um you know making it sort of equitable for everybody to have a chance to to get there because it's it is difficult. I mean you've got some and maybe there are ways that we can like other district look towards figuring out how we can have greater access maybe to students who wouldn't have the same opportunities based on teachers availability to do those kinds of trips with their students and things like that too along with obviously bus availability things like that as well but um it's always food for thought i just wanted to say it's funny because growing up as a student in this district who started in elementary school that was the favorite thing to do every year was to go and look at tadpoles and learn how to snowshoe and all of that stuff um, in the uh, in the 70s, uh, when I was a student at Sally Elementary, was the biggest thing um, of the year for us. 
um, every year. So I think that it's pretty incredible to see how much it's grown and developed. No one ever wanted to stay in the one cabin that the skunk inevitably sprayed in every year. Um, but, uh, but yes, it's, um, it's a pretty amazing place. So thank you for that. Yes, Trustee Carpuck. Um, just wondering uh, if you had the um, six week program, any revenues generated by rental of McQueen Lake, does that stay with McQueen Lake Center or does it just go into general sort of revenue for the school district? That's a very good question. I don't know if I've ever generated any revenue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, the, I would, sorry. <clears throat> through the, uh, board chair, yes. um, through the board, I believe that any rental income that you have goes into a special fund, but I could fact check. No, just then we do have, we do have a few trust funds set up between like the people uh, um, that are, that were interested in McQueen Lake and wanted to see McQueen Lake for set up, or set up years ago. And we're allowed to take out the interest on those funds. So I have access to that money. I haven't touched any of it since I've become a principal up there. And uh, the principal stays um, generating interest. So there is a bit of money that we've got for special projects, et cetera. Up at McQueen Lake that's been put there by, by other people. We also have, just with the busing, we also have schools, like our school is a lot of four buses for every science and technology school, and we've used eight buses now. Some schools go up quite a bit. We just have to pay for the own bus, our own buses after, after four. Right? Some schools don't go up as much for whatever reason. Thank you so much. Thank My last so much. question for you, mm. the mannequin. Yeah. Um, other than the mannequin, would there be a, like, um, are you looking forward to along with having that obviously next year? Um, has there been any talk about reinstituting the fundraiser um, dinner from McQueen Lake when we are able to do that? Is that something that is still wanted by the, the folks who? I, I think that's that something that would be considered by everyone that we'd like to do. It's, okay. It's a real community building type event. We'd like to do that. That's typically um, happening in December of every year. Right now, we've got already the, the 50th anniversary in October, in December. So I, I would like to see it happen for sure. Okay. Sounds like maybe a great opportunity to celebrate. Yeah, we'll Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. You. I'm going to turn it before. Well, first of all, gratitude. You are, we say this to everyone, you are free to go, but you're welcome to stay. <laughs> we'll always leave if that makes you feel any better. But, um, <laughs> but I will turn it just over to Dr. Nixon uh, to wrap up the topic. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. It, it's, uh, I think that was one of the most innovative presentations I've seen in some time, the juxtaposition between the bus and the, the nature. And you had me right away on, uh, on that note, but I've met you um, in your school and I can see you bring the same passion, um, getting to know kids and knowing what they like, as well as the pedagogy behind uh, what you do. You take it seriously. And it, it just shows through this presentation tonight. So thank you so much. And um, I, I can't think of a better way to start our public board meeting. So. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be Thank here. you so much, Thank Principal. You. Thank you. So you're not staying? Watch when I get all right. Okay. Sorry. Wow. I, mean, I, just leave. I think I could read that. We're not staying. Okay. And so we just need one minute to change our technology. So we're going live, yes? Yeah. Where's your looking? That video is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, thank you everybody for your patience. Uh, we were just switching over to um, go live on Facebook because we do have a public presentation of this evening. Just before we um, commence with the rest of our agenda, I just wanted to again, because there are people who are joining us uh, after um, the meeting started, just to really, again, um, respectfully honor and acknowledge that we are meeting in the um, territory and the lands of the Shikwapnik people. And this is a land that we are honored to live, uh, learn and really enjoy the beauty of every day. So, um, with that being said, uh, we just finished our education topic uh, for the evening, which was um, incredible, actually. Uh, for those who are joining late, if you haven't, uh, if you get a chance to watch it, it's actually really worth um, uh, having a view for, for sure. Uh, this evening, public inquiries, petitions, and written presentations. Uh, for that, we have none, uh, which makes us um, <laughs> moving on to item next, which is parent advisory groups and district parent advisory groups. Uh, we do have a presentation, item 7.1, on our agenda, a DPAC presentation on sexual health education. Um, did you want me to turn it over to you, Dr. Nixon, for introduction, or should I just go ahead and introduce the speakers? Okay, um, I am going to go ahead and introduce uh, the speakers. So I believe, uh, Mr. Ponte, Chris, I believe it is you who I'm going to be turning it over to first. Maybe you could introduce your group from, from DPAC, and uh, I will let you take over um, the presentation and welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks to the board members and the district staff for giving us a few minutes of your valuable time. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, I'm sure you've seen in the news of both the student-led protests from around the province and the country. Um, unfortunately, incidents uh, around sexual misconduct are plaguing our district as well. Um, in 2018, I was on the superintendent's task force on student safety, which made several recommendations. Um, unfortunately, these have not all been acted on, and parents and students in our district are still very concerned. Um, because of this, DPAC formed a committee uh, to look at ways to improve things. Uh, we are fortunate that we had Martha Solomon volunteer to chair this committee. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to her to uh, have her share our thoughts uh, with us tonight, as well as one of the committee members, Erin Mitchell, who's got her hands in everything DPAC, as you know. Anyways, take it away, uh, Martha. Martha's going to need to share her screen, if that's possible. He's muted. So we can see the screen. Martha. I think Martha might be muted. Thank you very much for telling me that. You'd think that at this point in the pandemic, I would have figured this out, but apparently, apparently not. So uh, thank you, Chris, for that introduction. I think you summed up um, sort of the, how we got to this committee really well. And uh, thank you again for uh, letting us present this evening. I am going to, um, oh, there we go, be uh, kind of powering through this presentation to keep things short for you. But our object objectives this evening are really to share our concerns uh, as parents and concerns that we've heard from other parents, uh, share a little bit of information about the positive uh, values of sexual health education in schools, and to ask that SC73 adopt a new curriculum delivery model uh, for a district that addresses safety, um, quality of instruction, equitable access to the curriculum, and sustainability. Um, there are lots of things that, I don't know why my advance button isn't working. There we go. Um, but there are lots of things that people are surprised to learn about uh, sexual health education in schools. And one of them really has to do with our curriculum here in BC. As most of you probably know, um, sexual health components are part of the uh, physical health education curriculum from kindergarten to grade 10. So theoretically, students in BC, BC could be receiving this curriculum for 11 years. Um, and we know that that's not happening. Um, people are also uh, kind of interested and unaware of the fact that uh, sexual health education in the curriculum covers a lot more than pregnancy for prevention or STI prevention. Um, a lot of the focus of this curriculum is on abuse prevention, um, staying safe, staying healthy uh, in age-appropriate ways from kindergarten, as I said, all the way to grade 10. 
Um, why is sexual health education so important in schools? Well, we have significant data to show that having access to comprehensive sexual health education helps to reduce negative health outcomes and promote positive health outcomes. And that's not just for adolescent health. Those outcomes last throughout people's lifetimes. So what are these particular benefits? Well, uh, they range. I mean, um, they... Uh, Sexual health education in schools helps to promote informed and responsible sexual decision making. Um, it reduces sexual risk taking amongst adolescents. It also addresses and helps to reduce gender based violence and discrimination. And that's something that, as Chris said, we've been hearing a lot uh, from students that they want access to this kind of education. Um, it also increases positive health outcomes like condom and contraception use, and it actually increases the age of first sexual activity. So one of the things that people are often surprised to learn is that parents overwhelmingly support sexual health education in schools. This is a 2020 survey that was done of parents across Canada, and you'll see that 85% of Canadian parents support sexual health education in schools, and there's BC as one of the highest with 90% support. What's interesting about this, though, is that parents aren't just supporting sexual health education in schools. These parents in this survey stated that they preferred that the sexual health education their children receive cover a broad range of topics, including things such as uh, gender diversity, uh, gender discrimination and stereotypes, harassment and coercion, safer sex practices, including and, and as well as contraception, STI prevention, uh, and puberty. So do students want sexual health education in school? Overwhelmingly, again, the answer is yes. Youth in Canada perceive school to be a valuable primary source of sexual health education, but they are extremely dissatisfied with the lack of sexual health education they're receiving in schools. And they're also dissatisfied with the quality of the instruction and content that they're receiving in schools. So what do they want? Well, we actually have great data on this too, especially in BC from Youth Co. Um, we know that they want uh, specialized teachers to teach in small group formats. They do not want a, an auditorium style uh, lesson. They do not want their gym teachers or classroom teachers to be teaching this material. They want and expect the material to be up-to-date, accurate, and helpful. And most of all, they want it to be 2SLGBTQIA plus inclusive as standard. They want to receive this education multiple times per year. And as we know from uh, this media coverage, they want more education and information about sexual and gender-based violence prevention and response. So why are we here tonight? What are our concerns and what are the concerns we've heard from parents? Well, currently we uh, personally have experienced and we've heard from many, many other parents that students aren't able to access the curriculum in any kind of consistent or equitable manner in our district. Um, we also, as Chris mentioned, have ongoing parental concerns about student safety in our schools, especially surrounding gender-based and sexualized violence. Um, we also have significant data to show that our region has worrisome sexual health outcomes uh, in everything from sexual harassment to contraception and condom use and dating violence. Um, we're not doing well, especially compared to provincial averages. So in terms of data, we have we know that uh, students in our region, which uh, in for this particular report is the 2018 Adolescent Health Survey uh, from the McCreary Center Society, we know that students in our region are more likely than the provincial average to have had oral sex or sexual intercourse, but they're far less likely to have used condoms and they're far less likely to have uh, used contraception. In terms of gender-based violence, uh, we're also well above the provincial averages in terms of reported verbal sexual harassment. So 57% of female students in our region reported verbal sexual harassment in the previous year. The provincial average is 50%. In terms of physical sexual harassment, 41% of female students reported experiencing physical sexual harassment in the previous year. And I'll just uh, weigh in a little bit here that um, physical sexual harassment is unwanted sexual touching. 41% is very high, and it's much higher than the provincial average, which is 31%. And we do know that non-binary students um, have reported similar rates of sexual harassment to female students. Um, we know that students have been asking for a long time for help dealing with sexual harassment that they experience. Um, we're hearing it more and more, and I've included some quotes from students here that are in the McCreary Center Society report, um, but we hear it from students all the time as parents. We hear it from our own children as well. In terms of student safety, we know that in SC73, 
um, students feel less safe than the Canadian average in their schools. So 54% of female secondary students and 59% of male students feel safe in their school, but the Canadian norm is 64% for girls and 67% for boys. <clears throat> so what's the takeaway? Why am I sharing this bad news? I mean, this is this is really hard on our uh, for us as parents to, to have this kind of data. Well, the takeaway is that really our regional adolescent health comes are worse often worse than the provincial average and they're deteriorating. And students here report feeling less safe at schools than the Canadian average. But the good news, the really good news is that the sexual health components of the uh, physical health education curriculum actually address all of these health and safety issues. So for example, everything from healthy sexual decision-making and uh, gender equity to abuse prevention, um, identifying trusted adults and healthy relationships and accurate and up-to-date sources of health information and sexting, a lot of these things are covered in the curriculum, but it has to be taught in our classrooms in order for the, the kids to have access to these uh, skills um, and information. So as a committee, we actually met with the wonderful Vesi Mashikas and Alex Inglis, uh, to whom we're so grateful for all the wonderful work that they do in our district, to talk about some new initiatives that they've been planning around sexual health education uh, in our schools. And we were actually quite concerned with uh, the pr new proposed resources. Um, it kind of rang some alarm bells for us as parents. It felt very reactive rather than proactive. Uh, in ways that felt kind of rushed, and we felt like it didn't place student safety or well being at the forefront. And we're really concerned that this new model is actually not safe, especially for Indigenous and racialized students, for 2S LGBTQIA students, and for female students. So, what we're asking is that ST73 hire a minimum of two certified sexual health educators who are also certified BC teachers who have their BEd to deliver the K-10 sexual health education curriculum yearly in all SD73 schools. This model is not new. It's already uh, a similar model is functioning in SD23 in the central Okanagan. Um, and there are so many benefits for this model. First of all, it meets all of those parent and student expectations for sexual health education in schools that I identified at the beginning of this presentation. It also addresses many of the concerns that we have as parents and the concerns that we've heard from students. Um, first, of all, first of all, it addresses student safety concerns. It ensures quality of instructions, instruction from uh, teachers who are not only BC certified teachers, but also subject area experts. It provides equitable access to this curriculum to all SD73 students. And it ensures that 2S LGBTQIA plus inclusion is standard in all sexual health classes in our district. And this is a proactive solution. It's sustainable. Even more benefits, it helps SD73 to meet some of its uh, commitments, especially the ones that Chris was talking about earlier in the introduction, um, regarding safety and sexual misconduct in schools. Um, in terms of the 2018 SD73 Superintendent's Task Force on Student Safety, education and programming, starting at the elementary school level, uh, to educate students about healthy relationships, as well as measures they can take to report incidents and seek report with support, um, again, this kind of information about gender-based and sexual violence, uh, recognizing abusive situations and unsafe situations and how to handle them is all part of the curriculum. Also in the SC 73 2020 2021 Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Report, it states that SC 73 has a critical role in educating youth in partnership with parents about healthy boundaries and relationships, that it strives to be a strong voice for positive change, by addressing issues such as sexual misconduct and violence that continue to plague communities and disproportionately impact the lives of girls and Aboriginal youth. Um, the focus on safety and healthy relationship is central to provide programs and services to students. So this, this uh, ask that we have tonight would really help um, SC73 meet some of those commitments that it's made to enhance student safety, uh, especially around gender-based and sexualized violence. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration this evening. On behalf of our committee, I want to, uh, again, thank you for, for letting us present this evening. Thank you very much, Martha. I'm just gonna wait until um, 
the screen's not being shared just so I can see everybody's uh, faces. There we go. Um, thank you so much for, for your very thoughtful, very thorough presentation this evening. Um, to Chris, um, Ponty, and to you, Aaron Mitchell, as well, for, for sitting uh, with us through this presentation. Um, it's obviously been very informative, going to be a lot for us to, to take away and think about. Uh, the way that public presentations or that um, parent advisory group presentations work is that people come, they present to us. We don't have a response at the time, but it does give us an opportunity to take away from that, um, have a chance to discuss it, and we will uh, get back to you in regards to this presentation. So I just, um, on behalf of the uh, the Board of Education um, and staff, I just really want to thank you for, for your very thoughtful consideration in um, obviously putting together your request to come, but also in um, your very thorough um, very, uh, I don't want to use the word fulsome because I think it's overused, but it was a very thorough, very fulsome presentation. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, we will definitely get a response to you um, in regards to your request. Thanks thank again, you. everyone. Have thank a good night. you. You too. Thank you so much. All right. So, um, We'll move on to item next. Uh, item next is uh, your big item, Dr. Nixon. Uh, reports <coughs> from Superintendent of Schools, starting with 8.1 Municipal Disease Prevention Plan. Through you, Board Chair Grieve, to the Board. Uh, the Board of Education continues to ensure the health and safety of students and staff by following provincial and federal health orders and K-12 sector guidance. A summary of safety measures that are continuing in our school and all district facilities are the daily health awareness check, and you'll note a language change from the daily health check which refers to staying home when sick, continuing to practice hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette and regular cleaning and disinfecting of frequently touched surfaces, including water fountain mouthpieces. Practicing strategies to create space, space pardon me, between individuals and gathering or working together while adhering to preferred educational approaches. Um, sign in for visitors will continue and we are also really emphasizing personal choice when it comes to wearing a mask and we expect all individuals to be supported and respected. For community use, we do know that we have opened up and we do understand that um, secondary gymnasiums are open five to 10 weekdays. And we also have self Catholic secondary music room open. coverage and services, but please follow the regular process and we will um, meet your requirements as we can. We continue to monitor student and staff absenteeism. Student absenteeism has been better than historical averages and teacher absenteeism has been fluctuating, but overall we've had less than 10% of positions unfilled. For school-based support staff, we have, only been, um, we have only been successful at filling approximately half of the requests. And we recognize that this is an area that we have to continue to grow in. In HR, uh, we have made a commitment to continuing to uh, fill these positions that will continue to focus on what we hope to be uh, zero unfilled positions. And of course, we appreciate everybody's continued persistence and support in tracking this data and in helping us to maintain uh, safety in our schools for all students and staff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nixon. Um, that report is uh, for information purposes. I don't know if trustees have any questions for Dr. Nixon. To item next. Seeing none, uh, the next item is yours as well, Dr. Nixon. Thank you so much. Through you, Board Chair Grieve, to the Board. Since our last report, we have applied for a new bank account for Ralph Bell and renovations are in full progress. Moving boxes are ordered and bus routes are drafted. So Juniper, Marion Schilling, Pacific Way, Dallas and Westmount Elementary School staffs have had presentations from HR to clarify how the surplus process works and we thank the KTTA executive for their support in these meetings. Support of students and families in the process of transitioning from one school to another is our continued focus. And we continue to look forward to a successful opening, reopening of Ralph Bell Elementary School, as well as successful transitioning to all uh, the new locations for our students. Thank you very much. Um, and again, Dr. Nixon, that report was for information purposes, yes. Um, trustees, do you have any questions uh, for Dr. Nixon on that item? Seeing none, we will move on to item next, uh, 8.3, secondary school fees report. 
Thank you. Through you, Board Chair Grieve, to the Board. Boards of Education approve school fees, which have been reviewed by each school's Parent Advisory Council as per the School Act and as per our Administrative Procedure 505. The majority of schools' fees have remained comparable to last year with modest increases to enhancement fees. Assistant Superintendent Hamlet will now provide his report on school fees for the Board's information. Thank you, Superintendent Hickson and Chair Green to the rest of the board. So tonight is the annual report that is required for the AP 505. Certainly, the district recognizes its obligation under the School Act to provide free of charge to school and students resident in the district and education program required to meet the graduation requirements, as well as educational resource materials necessary for participation in such a program. As you well know, the district is also committed to providing a wide range of additional educational opportunities for all students, including many enriching activities. And I believe there are instances when it is appropriate to, uh, that a fee may be charged for goods or services materials provided. Administrative 505 fees deposits and collections outlines under what circumstances fees could be charged and for optional activities, project equipment costs, consumables, I would say, uh, goods and services related to the curriculum. And in accordance with uh, AP 505, each school schedule of fees as presented at a public board, public parent meeting of the advisory uh, council, parent advisory council. And each school has a uh, uh, process as outlined in Administrative Procedure 506, student financial assistance in place uh, to ensure equitable uh, access to enhancement activities and goods and services. So there is that policy uh, or AP as well. As Dr. Nixon had indicated, the majority of uh, classroom course enhancement fees remain the same across the district from 2022 to 2023, so next school year. Where there are changes, it's typically due to the increase of cost of materials and or supplies. Uh, we've seen increases, for example, in our shop courses, uh, whether it's wood shop or power uh, mechanics, that's another example. Uh, I've cited a couple of the schools, but that's a constant measure. Uh, all that it's consumed or wood that's consumed in those courses. And foods courses as well. There was increases in foods courses, for example, five, several of the schools increase their costs there. Um, there's also increases, I mentioned at Sally Secondary, uh, to allow for uh, excursions and field trips based on those courses. Uh, all the academy of fees across academy, special academy of fees, fees remain the same for the next school year. So there's no increases to the school district academy fees, but there were increases uh, associated with the trades and transition programs at TRU. As associated with, associated with, and they are typically in line with TRU increases. Uh, it's slight, though. Uh, comparatively speaking, the account that is provided to you it goes through all the courses, through all the schools, through all the academies, and through all the trades and transition programs. And as per Administrative Procedure 505, uh, part of that. Case as it's presented uh, at the end of May. I can take any questions. Thank you so much, Assistant Superintendent Hamlet. Um, I know that this again uh, is for information purposes only. Uh, trustees, do you have any questions for either Assistant Superintendent Hamlet or um, Superintendent Nixon? This item. I'm just curious why at Logan Lake they're charging for math 10 and 11 and also for a math workbook for eight and nine. Great. Uh, they are, uh, that's a consumable, so students have the option. They can purchase the book or not purchase the book. That's optional. But if they purchase the workbook and use it, that's considered a consumable. So that's an option to the student. The flip is they can flip up, flip copy all those resources and that way as well. But some students prefer to work in the book of home. Logan Lake is also challenged with small class sizes, very small class sizes. Uh, that's again, that's my that's my answer for that one. But, Tell. Uh, 
um, supplemental. Uh, and and is everybody good with that at Logan Lake? I mean, I, I have recognized the small class sizes, but I also know it's a, kind of a district goal for math. I don't know if it's important or or how it works out. Anyway, I'll just raise a raise a an interest on that. Huh. Is everybody good or? It is interesting. Uh, really chair to the question uh, raised by the trustee. Once again, this has been tossed by each parent advisory council. And each so these were brought forward. The principal has a certain period of time. Uh, it's point from memory. Sorry, I don't have the name in front of me, but I mean, it's by the end of February. Um, with this year and the startup that we had in January, January I, think, I think someone brought it done yeah, after in February, to be honest. But we got it all done and we approved. Presented to the parent advisory council. Okay. Um, and maybe, uh, and I don't, uh, do any trustees have other, any other questions for Assistant Superintendent Hamlin? Yeah. Did you have one as well, Trustee Kershaw? Just don't, oh, okay, yes, Trustee Sim. So, and, and is it just history at Logan Lake that they charge for these things? Like the science workbook for eight to 10 is also $10. Or sorry, is also $10 at Logan Lake. So is it just a student, is it just a school culture that they find it easier to use use that? Or I mean it's just interesting to me that they're the only one and that there's a fee, but maybe it is a history. I can <clears throat> yes. one chair. <laughs> Speaking with Principal <laughs> Collins, I know they're expecting a grad class two students to participate in the grad that's coming up at Logan Lake. So they are challenged with smaller class sizes. Um, that's, I, if there's a question, I can go back to Mr. Collins and get clarification. But again, it's been passed by their parent advisor. So. Sorry, and I don't know. Um, I don't know if I if this is clarifying the question. Maybe the trustee Sim has. I, I don't. Um, if it's if I'm off base, please tell me. But I'm wondering if the question is that in our other schools within our district, our students who are taking math and history um, having to pay for workbooks in the same like are they taking the same curriculum not having to pay for it at different schools within the district that they are paying for in Logan Lake I don't want to put words in your mouth trustee Sim but I do wonder if that's the the, the nature of the question I think it's well said you are more chair to the question the workbooks are optional um, I am in uh, they, students can purchase them or not. Typically, that's what's been done, but I, I, I don't have a quick answer for that. It's the same curriculum. Okay, so supplemental. So if the, if the workbooks were available at all schools within the district, would the students have the option of purchasing those workbooks as well at every school um, that provides the, the same curriculum? Trustee, or Chair Green's question. I'd have to look into that. I, okay. I don't. I can't comment. These are the these are the fees that okay. are supplied by the schools passed by the really? advisory councils. Okay. Okay. Just yes. And just the only reason being is because is Logan Lake actually the only one that's offering the opportunity to print them off? In which case, is that just not a great idea that could be available for more students? So there's lots in there, right? Like, I mean, there's a lot of kids who maybe would like that. The Sim family might be doing better in some of the math courses with the hard <laughs> puppy, and I'm wondering if I could get one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it is just a wide question about why and nowhere else. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Sim. Yes, Trustee Carpa. Thank you. I see you, Trustee Kershaw. That's okay. Thank you. That, that was actually sort of where I was going was that my, my curiosity would be, and I understand that this is for information and mm, yeah. really just a flagging, but my curiosity would be, I've just had a couple of students go through these courses and, and I don't recall ever actually having the option to have a, a printed workbook. So it, it's more just a, maybe a, an operational inquiry for a later date. Okay. I, 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 I did note it as a curiosity also, um, but I, I don't recall in our school that we're actually being given mm -hmm. We do a lot on Google. Okay. Yeah, just, just a like, curiosity. So maybe maybe it's a trust. Maybe this is a trustee inquiry for um, a later next meeting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. And Trustee Carpock, I didn't know if you had a question. I thought I saw that you raised your hand. Um, I'm, I'm have different levels of concern around this and that um, one, if students are doing 
worksheets, normally that's something that's a resource that the school supplies. And I worry that this could be a slippery slope in that workbooks now become, you know, mm -hmm. that we're charging parents for something that should, ne should possibly be provided by the school in any respect versus as an additional supplemental resource that parents can purchase above and beyond. And so I'm a, I'm a little concerned that this seen as, we, as parents very often we get shamed if we're not doing our very best for students. And so there can be this feeling of obligation to purchase something in order for children to succeed. And I'd really hope that this isn't where parents are feeling pressured to buy an extra resource that should perhaps be part of the regular instruction curriculum and supplies supplied by the school. So that's my concern. So can I make a suggestion um, and maybe just for the, for the board, because it sounds like there might be some questions around process and around how this looks and we don't have the information in front of us to actually know exactly what it is that we're talking about and whether or not it is something that is um, possibly not in the best interest or is in the best interest and so forth. Um, so I'm going to make a suggestion that we actually make that as a trustee inquiry that we can put on the agenda for our next board meeting and we can come back to it if that is something that the, the will of the board would be amenable to that we could um, put it forward as a trustee inquiry, get the answers and then have a chance to have a conversation about it at that time. Does that work? Yes, Trustee Kershaw. You would move that, so moved. Uh, can I have a seconder for that? Seconded by Trustee Sim. Uh, any discussion on the motion on the floor? I can see that. Yeah, me too. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? And opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I, Trustee Kershaw. I did want to note one thing that of course any school fees and this is more just for people that might be listening um we actually get listening, which is fantastic any school fees are of course uh including these uh subject to our student financial assistance so, so families could certainly get the financial assistance through that not that that's an easy process but just any school fees <laughs> okay. Just outlined in the background. Press OK to keep your TV on. Thank you. OK. The middle button, maybe? No, oh, yeah. We're done. <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Trustee Kershaw. Um, does that end that particular agenda item? this yeah. evening yes thank yes. you board chair Greg. okay excellent thank you um moving on to item next item 8.4 um district student advisory council report board chair grieve to the board as per ap or administrative procedure 381 the district student advisory council will communicate with the board twice annually through trustee representative reports under trustee reports inquiries and good news and at regular public board meetings this is the second annual report on these activities of the District Student Advisory Council, which is to provide the board with youth input on perspectives on topics that directly pertain to students. I look forward to Ryan <laughs> providing his second annual report for 2021-2022. Thank you, Superintendent Nixon. Good evening, Board Chair Grieve, Vice Chair Wade, Trustees. So annually, the BC Ministry of Education conducts a survey of grades 4, 7, 10, and 12 students and their parents and guardians. Uh, this is about, uh, it means about their school experience. And the results of these, uh, sur this survey is uh, reported to school districts annually as well. So we often, uh, and we always get the, uh, the raw numbers uh, and percentages of responses from students, but we don't always get the why as to uh, the reason for their response in the manner they do. So during January 12th meeting of the uh, District Student Advisory Council, the students were asked to work as a focus group. Um, so they examined the percentage of grades 7, 10, and 12 students who responded all of the time or many times to the survey question, is school a place where you feel like you belong? And they analyzed the results over a five-year period. And again, we were looking for them to provide some insight as to why students would answer the question the way they did. 
The council members were then tasked with conducting a similar discussion with the respective school-based student leadership groups and to report on the results of these discussions at the meeting night, district student advisory council. So what were some of the, the findings that were reported? The first one they spoke of was the impact of age and maturity. I found it was very interesting that they talked about the growth and maturity and self-actualization and how that impacted their relationship with the school over these years. And so by grade 10, they indicated that some students are developing these interests outside of their school community. And this actually may result in less of a feeling of connection or a sense of belonging um, as their world is expanding in terms of their school and their community. As well, by grade 12, students are becoming more future focused. And this may either increase student sense of belonging, i.e. Uh, the school is working closely with the student in terms of their, their preparation for their next step in their education or work, or it may decrease a sense of belonging. Uh, the student is becoming increasingly independent, much less reliant in the community. So depending on the individual student's circumstance, they would answer in a different way. He also indicated uh, the power of peer relationships and positive peer relationships. And the fact that these positive peer relationships, of course, reinforce a sense of importance. Another major theme in terms of uh, the reasons for levels of response were the relationship with caring adults. So similar to that of um, positive peer relationships, positive uh, student to adult or student to teacher or student to, to uh, school staff connection also contribute to this enhanced sense of uh, belonging. And finally, in terms of the, uh, the themes that we collect in terms of some reasons behind the responses, of course, connection to learning, passions, and interests. So one student coined the phrase, having something to look forward to has positively impacted their sense of belonging. So again, very individual students, having something to look forward to, connecting uh, to their, uh, their interests and passions. So we further then had a conversation about, so how do we increase the sense of belonging? How do we impact that response? Students spoke at length about the creation and the importance of the creation of a sense of community. And I thought it was, it was very astute for them, not only to talk about the major events that a school does to create culture and positive culture, but the individual classroom. And the students um, brought to the attention that especially at secondary school, they're often moving from when they're in elementary school, a connection to one classroom and a few people in that classroom to rotating through a number of classrooms and a number of teachers. They spoke about the importance of creating a sense of community in the individual classroom and doing so more than once. So as a former secondary school teacher myself, knowing that I would work hard to establish such a community when we first started, but then you launch into your program and the students were talking about regularly checking in about that sense of community in the classroom and about how everyone's feeling in terms of their connection, not only to the class, but their feeling of safety within that class. So I thought that was a very powerful um, piece of information. Um, they talked about deliberately, co deliberately creating opportunities for meaningful connection. Uh, and this is not only in terms of in a classroom or in a school, but that, that sense of collect connection in terms of student to student, but also space to space. And so ensuring that there are places in the school that directly connect with individuals of all um, backgrounds. He spoke openly about the need for supported, and there are not the need, but the importance of supported transitions. So focusing, and they, they, they looked at the data and they looked at what was happening in their schools, and they talk about that, um, that growth period between grade seven to grade 10, and programs that would teach students how to effectively communicate with others, whether it be mentorship, whether it be tutoring, whether it be other activities that connect older students with younger students. So even within our clubs or our extracurricular activities, the importance of those connections and older to younger students and the impact of individualized instruction. These were all examples that we brought forward in terms of supported transition. Um, again, connecting to passions and interests, they spoke at length about, you know, whether it be through classroom-based learning, experiential learning activities outside of the classroom, extracurricular activities, teams or clubs, just creating those opportunities for powerful connection to learning and that impact that it has on increasing a student's sense of belonging. 
And finally, and, and, and again, I was very proud to, to hear this of our young people. They talk about everyone in the system modeling the expectation to the use of welcoming and inclusive language and treating each other with kindness and respect, which is very easy to say, but not easy to act upon on a daily basis. Walk that talk. So that is uh, very quickly and briefly um, an overview of uh, many mm -hmm. the themes that can be heard in our conversations around increasing sense of belonging and really understanding why students may answer that question in the way that they do. That concludes my report. Thank you so much, Director Keenline. Um, trustees, uh, do any of you have any questions um, for Director Keenline on his report this evening, which is again, is for information purposes. Yes, Trustee Carbuck. Um, I'm just wondering what your sense is of the information pipeline, the flow of information between the Student Advisory Council and their principal councils and what's happening in the schools. Are this the issues that are being discussed by the Student Advisory Council that are then flowing into the principal's councils having a direct impact on how schools are functioning? And I'm, I'm just wondering if you know there's the, this push-pull that we get information from the students, but are the students pushing some of that back into their schools? I'm confident there, there, that is happening. Um, and I can give specific examples of you know, at least one school. When I was speaking to the students, they were having an epiphany uh, about these issues. And we always conclude our, our sessions with that sense of agency in terms of the students. So you're a district student advisory council. You're leaders within your respective schools. <laughs> how, how can you work with your school community to, to bring about the change that you want to see? So in, in one school, the students went back and they actually uh, met with their district student, or sorry, their principal's advisory council. They met with their principal and they, they came up with a plan. Uh, and it was at that point a plan to, um, this was a previous meeting, so it was a plan, I'm working from memory right here, but it was a plan to start uh, an organization within the school that would enhance um, that connection and enhance that sense of belonging. I can't remember if it was a coffee house or something like that. It was coffee. Was it? And they actually, well, do you want me to? Yeah, absolutely, please. <laughs> it was actually a really exciting initiative because one of the fellows that was there, he works for Super Save, and he got them to sponsor, and it became the safe space cafe almost where the students could look forward to it. And it just really set the tone for the school. It set the tone for, you know, some leadership. Like there was all sorts of positives and I believe that's still going on. I mean, that was the last report. We haven't had a meeting for a bit, but um, hmm. it, it was that type of a thing that could actually be shared out to more schools. It was such a simple idea with great success. And uh, as uh, was said, uh, student agency. Thank you, Trustee. So that's absolutely fantastic to hear because very often we sort of see as, as the information is flowing to us, but we don't necessarily see the, the flow back and the influence on the schools. And so it's really nice to hear that this isn't just a one way flow of information, but that these students are actually able to take these ideas that they're generating at their, their district council and get some action happening within their schools. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Any other questions uh, for Director Kimline? Evening? No, thank you very much for the, the information uh, this evening and for all the work that we do with our students. It's incredible, thank you. Thank you Moving on to item next, Chuck Nixon, uh, 8.5, childcare. Board Chair, I to the Board. School District uh, number 73, Board of Education approved our application for two child cares, one at Ralph Bell Elementary School and the other at Happydale through the Child Care Abuse New Spaces Fund. Assistant Superintendent Ronnie will now provide a report on progress with respect to these two child cares for the Board's information. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Nixon. Through you, Chair Grieb, to the board, School District 73 staff submitted two grant applications to the Child Care BC New Spaces Fund in November 2021. On March 28th of this year, 2023, District 73 is for both grant proposals, which provides up to $2,810,000 in capital funding for each project. 
These funding approvals will enable the district to create new child care spaces at Ralph Bell Elementary and Happy Vale Elementary. Each of these child care projects will create spaces for 24 children under 36 months of age and 48 spaces for children 30 months to school age. Upon approval of these projects, the Director of the Service McDonald has already started the process of preparing the tender for the portables that will be used as new child care spaces at each of the sites. Director McDonald has also begun working with the City of Kamloops to plan for public access, placement of portables, and securing site services to those portables. This is a very encouraging announcement for both School District 73 and the parents and caregivers of young children who are trying to secure child care. A link to the Ministry News release distributed on April 21st, 2022 is also provided at the end of my annual, and I'm happy to answer any questions trustees may have. Thank you so much, Assistant Superintendent Riley. Uh, trustees, do you have any questions uh, about the report that was presented to us for information purposes? All right, seeing none, thank you very much, Superintendent Riley. Uh, Dr. Nixon, um, item 8.6, good news. Hear you, Board Chair Grieve to the Board. The Board is responsible for student success, and one way to learn about this is through good news reports, which provide a summary of what school leaders share every four to six weeks. Uh, Manager Scogland has provided you with a summary of the good news that we received at the last school leaders meeting. If trustees have any questions, we would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nixon. Um, trustees, do you have any questions for Dr. Nixon on the report that was distributed in the, the packages for this evening's meeting? It is good news. All right, seeing none, I will move on to item next, and thank you very much for that uh, information. Um, item 8.7, the superintendent's report. Yes, Ellen. Thank you, Board Chair Grieve, to the Board. As per Board Policy 12, I report to the Board on a four to six week basis on my activities. The report for March and April is provided for the Board's information. I'm happy to answer any questions that the Board may have. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nixon. Um, trustees, do you have any questions for um, Superintendent Nixon on the report that was provided in your packages for information purposes after this evening's meeting? Great, seeing none. Um, Dr. Victor, does that close your report from the Superintendent of Schools for the Yes, it does. Thank you, Board Chair Green. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item next, uh, report to the Secretary of Treasurer. Um, Secretary Treasurer Cassidy, I'm going to turn Thank it over you. to you. Okay, so thank you, Board Chair Grieve, to the Board. It is my pleasure to present the 2220 draft annual budget in ministry format. As presented previously, the annual budget consists of three funds, um, the operating fund, the special purpose fund, and capital. And the ministry forms are easiest read from the back to the front. So this evening we are beginning with the capital fund, schedule four, page 13 of the budget document, which was the green document handed out. There are a few columns here that I will touch on, uh, reading from the left to the right uh, for the 22-23 year, starting with the invested in capital assets and local capital, and the total column for 22-23, and then of course the uh, 22 amended annual budget is to the right. Um, this budget was passed by the board on February 7th, 2022. Revenue under the header of invested in tangible capital assets from the Ministry of Education is 2,897,000, representing the bylaw portion of annual facility grant. Amortization of deferred capital revenue is 3.76 million for a total of 6.66 million. As assets are amortized over a period of time, for example, 40 years for a building, funding is received for these capital assets and also recognized, um, the funding received is also recognized over a similar period of time. Revenue in the local capital column is estimated at 25,000 for interest income for a total capital fund of 6,685,000. One side of the capital fund under invested in capital assets is 2,897,000, which was the same as the revenue representing the Ministry of Education bylaw portion of the annual facility grant used for larger repairs and maintenance in district facilities. 
Amortization of capital assets is six million two hundred and twenty-eight thousand for a total of nine million one hundred and twenty-six thousand. Amortization, although not a cash transaction, does port does form part of the overall spending plan for the district. Expenses for local capital is estimated at four million one hundred and forty-four thousand five hundred, representing the purchase of capital assets such as portable classrooms, computers, technology, maintenance vehicles and equipment, classroom furniture and equipment along with the district's portion of the Valley View Secondary Expansion Project at 1580000 Now this is a change since our last uh, presentation, um, reducing the portable uh, requirement because of the ones out of Valley View. The capital fund uh, shows a deficit balance of 2440000 However, what's not represented here is the opening balance of the capital fund at the start of the year. So on July 1, 2021, the opening balance of the capital fund is 32.7 million. The next fund is special purpose. Page 10 and schedule three is the summary of revenues and expenditures. 18,588,000 is expected from the Ministry of Education for programs such as the Classroom Enhancement Fund, Community Link, Annual Facility Grant, Operating Portion, French Language, early learning programs and the support staff learning improvement fund. Other re revenue is similar to the previous year and includes school generated funds, scholarships and contributor restricted. School district 73 business company is estimated lower than the 21-22 school year due to the conclusion of the COVID mitigation contract between this, the district's business company and the Ministry of Education and Childcare. Overall expenses within the special purpose fund are estimated to match revenues. And what is missing here is the funding approved under the BC tripartite agreement. Once this is known, it will be added for the 22-23 amended budget. Um, special purpose is estimated at 21,004,469. More details on the um, schedules can be found on pages 11 and 12. Now for the operating fund, a uh, schedule 2A, uh, page six shows the budgeted revenues from Ministry of Education at 165.336 million, which includes the operating grant, pay equity, funding for graduated adults, the student transportation fund and other ministry grants. What has changed from the previous public uh, presentation is um, an adjustment to the international student fee and um, the inclusion of funding for graduated adults. Provincial grants other is from the Ministry of Children and Families, As I mentioned, international students, uh, 4.4 million, local education agreement, 2.6, trades and transitions and other income of 360,000, community rentals and leases, investment income <coughs> and flats uh, for a total operating fund revenue of 163,256,000. Expenses for the operating fund broken down by salaries for employee groups totaling 122,133,000, benefits of 27,325,000, and supplies and services. Next slide. Uh, for 23 point, it's under 23.8 million um, for a total operating fund of 173,256,758. More details um, on the operating fund by function, program, and object are available on pages eight and nine. On schedule two, page five shows the revenue and expenses in summary form. And as you can see, revenue matches expenses uh, without the use of surplus to balance. Statement four, page four, outlines the changes in net financial assets of the district. The surplus or deficit in this case comes from the capital fund, as I mentioned. Purchase of capital assets of 4.1 million from local capital is listed, as well as purchases of capital assets from deferred capital revenue of 25.49 million. For the 22-23 school year, this amount includes the remaining funding to be spent on the Valley View Expansion Project, Parkrest Elementary, as well as the two uh, new child care centers that Associ Assistant Su Superintendent Riley mentioned. Including amortization amount of 6.2 million, the district is increasing its tangible capital assets by 23.4 million and its deferred capital revenue 
by 25.4 million to be recognized into revenue for future years. The net overall change then is 25.8 million. On statement two, page two, consolidated amounts of all three funds are shown. The top portion of the statement shows the ministry operating grant funded FTEs, both age and adult. This represents the data collection dates of September, February, and May. At this time, the district is close to the FTE as presented in the 21-22 amended budget in February. We projected, as you know, a modest increase of 42 students in September, but a decrease to the number of distributed learning students in February, so we're pretty close to last year. As we go through the staffing process for both the elementary and secondary schools, it would appear more students will be enrolled in the 22-23 school year. Total revenue for the 22-23 school year from all sources is estimated at this time of 200 million 947,192. Consolidated expenses by object represent salaries, benefits, supplies and services of the three funds at 203 million 387,572. The net loss of 2.4 million again shown is the capital deficit I mentioned previously. This will be covered by the opening balance in the capital fund. And finally, on page three, the enti entire budget is presented by funds for a total of $207,532,072. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Treasurer Cassidy. Um, so trustees, this is a, an action item um, where uh, the information that's been provided to the board uh, this evening for our consideration. Um, I was hoping that um, we could also, I'm gonna seek a motion for an approval uh, to have three meetings of the annual budget bylaw um, in this one meeting and we can get through that. Moved by Vice Chair Wade, seconded by Trustee McKelvey. Uh, any discussion on the motion as it sits on the floor? Seeing none, all those in favor of the three readings. Thank you and opposed. All right, seeing none, motion carried unanimously. Um, I will go ahead and read uh, the bylaw as it is written. I apologize in advance if I stammer my way through it. Um, so uh, the annual budget bylaw, uh, a bylaw of the Board of Education of School District Number 73, Camels Thompson called the board to adopt the annual budget of the board for the fiscal year 2022-2023 Pursuant to Section 113 of the School Act, RSBC 1996, C412, as amended from time to time, called the Act. One, the Board has complied with the provisions of the Act, ministerial orders, and Ministry of Education policies respecting the annual budget adopted by this bylaw. Two, this bylaw may be cited as School District Number 73, Camels Thompson Annual Budget Bylaw for Fiscal Year 2022-2023. Three, the attached statement two, showing the estimated revenue and expense for the 2022-2023 fiscal year and the total budget bylaw amount of $307,532,072 for the 2022-2023 fiscal year was prepared in accordance with the Act. Four, statements two, four, and schedules two to four are adopted as the annual budget of the board for the fiscal year 2022-2023, read a first time the 25th day of April, 2022. Um, a bylaw by the Board of Education of School District Number 73, Calis Thompson, uh, to adopt the annual budget of the board for the fiscal year 2022-2023 pursuant to Section 113 of the School Act, RSBC 1996, C-412, as amended from time to time. One, but the board has complied with the provisions of the Act, Ministerial Orders, and the Ministry of Education policies respecting the annual budget adopted by this bylaw. Two, this bylaw may be cited as School District Number 73, Counts Thompson, Annual Budget Bylaw for Fiscal Year 2022-2023. Three, the attached statement. Two, showing the estimated revenue and expense for the 2022-2023 fiscal year and the total budget bylaw amount of $207,532,072 for the 2022-2023 fiscal year was prepared in accordance with the Act. Four, statements two, four, <coughs> schedules two to four are adopted as the annual budget of the board for the fiscal year 2022-2023. Read for a second time, the 25th day of April, 2022. Of the Board of Education of School District 73, number 73, uh, Countless Thompson to adopt the annual budget of the board for the fiscal year 2022-2023 pursuant to section 113 of the School Act, 
RSPC 1996-412 as amended from time to time. One, the board has complied with the provisions of the acts, ministerial orders, and Ministry of Education policies respecting the annual budget adopted by this bylaw. Two, this bylaw may be cited as school district number 73's Council Thompson annual budget bylaw for fiscal year 2022-2023. Three, the attached statement two, showing the estimated revenue and expense for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, the total bylaw amount of $207,532,072 for the 2022-2023 fiscal year was prepared in accordance with the Act. Four, statements two, four, and schedules two to four are adopted as the annual budget of the Board of Education, oh, sorry, of the Board for the fiscal year 2022-2023 read a third time, passed and adopted the 25th day of April, 2022. Yes. I'll just amend it. Oh, looking for a motion. Amen. Moved by Trustee Kershaw, seconded by Trustee Ophi. Um, any discussion on the motion as it sits? No, nope. all those in favor? Excellent, and opposed? Motion is carried unanimously. Thank you so much. Um, Secretary you. Treasurer Cassidy, does that uh, conclude your reports for this evening? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, item next, uh, new business. Uh, we have none. Um, business arising from public inquiries, we have none. Uh, reports from committees and chair. Um, I just have a brief chair's report that I wanted to mention a couple of things this evening. Um, so this past weekend, uh, myself, Trustee McKelvey, Trustee Sim, Trustee Kershaw, Trustee O'Fee, Superintendent Nixon, and Secretary Treasurer Cassidy had the opportunity, and Trustee Jules, of course, sorry, I forget you at all, <laughs> uh, had the opportunity to uh, attend the AGM um, in, uh, in Vancouver with, um, in person, which was really nice after two years. Uh, it was a very, um, very good, uh, very business-focused couple of days with a lot of um, focus for um, keynote speakers and addressing and um, on truth and reconciliation and a lot of uh, presentations from elders within uh, different nations represented um, at the conference. So um, it was a good AGM, lots of business taken care of on Saturday as well. And uh, um, I believe that information about that um, is public in terms of motions that were passed and things like that. So if people are looking for more information, they can find that. Um, at that, uh, the branch meeting at the AGM, um, Trustee Karpuk, who wasn't able to attend, uh, was elected a member at large for Okanagan branch. Uh, so congratulations to her. Um, and then, of course, uh, today um, there was a media release as well that uh, the Ministry uh, of Education has provided formal support uh, for the district to develop options for a new school in Bachelor Heights. So that as well is, um, is good news and um, has also been something that's been commented in on the media. And that is it for my chair's report. Uh, we have no motion. Um, oh, sorry, trustee's reports and inquiries. Uh, trustee Karpak, you had two under item 13. Yes. Um, first of all, I would like to recognize um, North Camp Senior Secondary and South Camp Senior Secondary who sent almost 80 delegates down to the um, Vancouver um, Mock United Nations um, simple or model the United Nations um, event that happened uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And uh, from all reports that I've heard back, that was extremely successful. And um, they had a great time and they learned a lot. So um, congratulations to all those delegates uh, for information. Each student that goes is assigned a country and a uh, United Nations committee, and they have to they have to research that country's uh, stance on an issue that's going to be discussed at those committees, and then have to uh, represent those countries and what their uh, positions would be, and prepare um, a position paper to present at the committees. So it's uh, quite in depth. They have to do a lot of uh, research and they don't always necessarily wind up representing a country that has the same values as they hold themselves personally. So it can be quite a challenge. So um, well done for all of those uh, youth that are going. And um, <clears throat> my second item was, um, I was fortunate enough to be healthy on Sunday and so I was able to go to uh, Boogie the Bridge. And I just wanted to mention that Kamloops School of the Arts uh, 
prepared an absolutely wonderful dance routine that was showcased as part of the opening ceremonies and the warm up. And they did an absolutely spectacular job of energizing the crowd and showing off their skills. Uh, so they represented us well. As well, there were at least two different schools that signed up teams to run Boogie. And uh, so very well done for all those who participated on Sunday. Excellent, thank you so much, Trustee Carpock. Um, that concludes uh, that item. We have no uh, motions, and so that brings us to the notice of meetings. Schedule upcoming meetings. Uh, the next regular public board meeting will occur on Monday, May 9th, 2022. Um, here at the school board office and the public is invited to join by Zoom through SC73 Facebook page. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved by Trustee Ophie, second by Trustee Kershaw. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a safe evening. Thank you. Thank you.